out of the Bible. In First Samuel, we're going to start in chapter 13 and read a verse. We're going to treat a strange and unique subject tonight. It sort of locks two different prophets in a time warp. You wouldn't think that the life of Jeremiah's time span had anything to do with the days of Samuel and Saul. And they, they didn't, but tonight they do because of Bible doctrine, spiritual law, and divine principle. Hallelujah. And so we're going to deal on this subject, the doctrine of Jeremiah demonstrated in the life of Saul. Now that's a long ways apart, but you may not think so when we're done. All right, we're starting out concerning Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13, one verse. It reads like this, verse 10, And it came to pass that as soon as Saul had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. Chapter 15, there's another verse, verse 14 of chapter 15. Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Samuel said to Saul, Stay and I'll tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And everybody said, Say on. If you stay, we'll tell you what the Lord has said unto us tonight concerning your life. That's what is Saul, uh, Samuel saying to Saul. So hang in there, you may hear from heaven. In the 16th chapter, I'll read you one verse, verse 2. Samuel said, How can I go, Lord? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. Hmm. The third sacrifice seems like it had some substance to it. Hello. <laughs> now in Jeremiah chapter 1, and we'll be done with the text. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Seems to me like you've been around for a while. Now you may not have remembered it, but God doesn't know something that don't exist. And before he formed you in the belly, he knew you. Could it be that you lived before you came to this planet? I said, could it be that you sprang from the loins of God? Could it be that there is uh, no time in the mind of the Almighty? Time is just a pimple on the horizon of eternity. The puny 6,000 years of human existence really don't mean too much to him. He knew you before he ever formed you in the womb. Amen. And if he knew you, and it's an important thing to know God, but rather to be known of God, Paul said. Now, someone said, I can know God. I believe I know God, but does God know you? Does he work with you? Does he confirm your testimony? Can you actually see him in conjunction with what you're doing? Hallelujah. All right. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Now, that's an early sanctification. Well, here's a prophet that got sanctified before he came out of the womb. He was known of God before he was even put in the womb. It seems to me like you folks could know God a whole lot quicker than you do. God could know you a whole lot sooner than he does. Seems like some of you could get sanctified quicker than you have. If some folks got sanctified in the womb, Surely by the time you're born again in the womb of the church, you ought to come forth sanctified. And I ordain thee a prophet unto the nation. Do you know that you're ordained to do whatever you're called to do? And what you're called to do is very obvious by the results and the fruit thereof. If you haven't success at what you're doing, far be it for me to get in your path and block your way. Go to it and go for it. Except the Lord build the house, they'll labor in vain that build it anyway. Except the, the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain anyway. You can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. If this thing be not of God, said Gamaliel, it'll blow over. So it was of God, and it blew over the whole world. Even Tampa. Hallelujah. 
So we're here with it tonight. I said, oh, Lord God, I cannot speak from a child, and suddenly he got rebuked for saying he couldn't do nothing, for claiming to be childish. Now, it's time to put away childish things when you become a man, or for that matter, a woman. I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, but I've got to put it away at some point in my career, my spiritual career. Babes in the marketplace, I've mourned unto you and you've not lamented, I've piped unto you and you've not danced. Well, here I am crying and giving you a teary-eyed story, how come you don't weep? Hey, I can weep, I can cry. Can you give me enough mourning and enough substance, enough material to make me cry? You know, I know how to cry, but it takes a little bit to move me. And I, I enjoy music, and I enjoy folks piping on to me, and I enjoy hearing that certain sound for miles around that's got that native impressive too. That just rings to the marrow of my bones. And I can dance if you, if you can pipe to me, and I can... A mourn if you can lament to me. It's within my capacity. But folks standing here tonight, born in the fire, will not live in the smoke. People who are used to uh, being honed in and piped in and tied in and just hooked and connected in to the pipeline cannot get by on anything less than what they're used to. Say amen. So the Lord said, don't you say you're a child for... Thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And God has been dealing with me this uh, last few months with this very uh, substance, subject, and matter that I have to go in this unique ministry of individual prayer, faith, or revelation, uh, prophetic words, uh, dealing with the lives of people past and present and future. I have to go to all that he sends me. That goes for preachers and churches and individuals that sit in churches. Say, Amen. Thou shalt go. Now, as if he had a choice about it. There is no choice when God says, Thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. There may be people that the God will send the preacher to tonight sitting here. And does the preacher have any choice? Mm -mm. He has to go. He's on a commandment. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Not only do you have to go to people, you have to speak words. You have to speak messages to them and not one of your own imagination or something you made up or your own thought or theory. You have to speak exactly what God tells you, what God commands you. Now, how do I know if it's God that's commanded me to say those words? The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Have you ever touched your mouth? Some folks have been touched all over. They've been touched in their backache and touched in their headache and... A touch in their heart, but it's important to touch in your mouth because when God touches your mouth, He's got all of you. That's the worst part of you that controls the pain. But when God put forth His hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth, the Lord said, I've put my words in thy mouth, so don't matter what you're saying, it's going to come out right. No matter what you're worried about, it's going to come out the way I put it there because my hand put it there, and you will inadvertently sometimes just blunder in to the will and in spite of yourself, obey God. Amen. Be not afraid of their faces. Now, here is a, a marvelous sequence. You must go to whom God sent you. Command everything God tells you to speak. Don't worry about what you're talking about because God laid his hand on your mouth. And now you can't be afraid of their faces. It doesn't matter who's got me old faith religion tonight or about the cloud up in thunder, storm, and rain. You can't be afraid of their face. And that goes for every one of you that's listening to the Word tonight when it comes to your time to obey God. Now, whatever you do, don't ever argue with the means and the method. Amen. I'm almost... You want to sit down? You may sit down. I see you sitting down one by one. So before we have a mass exodus to the chairs, I'll give you permission. Say amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So now here's the Lord sending people, the prophet to people, can't be afraid of their faces. I am with thee to deliver thee. Now, here's an amazing thing. When God sends you to speak his word to people of whom you cannot be afraid, you know it's God. He's laid his hand on your mouth, and if you are not afraid, then God will deliver you. It's an amazing thing. God has to deliver you from people, people he sends you to, to speak to, to do what God commands you to do to them. And yet God delivers you from them people. And after he delivers you from the people by confirming 
and upholding what you're doing, then he delivers the people from whatever affliction or problem they have. Isn't that something? Hallelujah. Ah, yes. Now, he put forth his hand and touched his mouth. He said, I put my word in your mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdom. Now, some people can't even rule their own house. But don't you know God has called and ordained you to rule over nations and to rule over kingdoms and to judge angels and very soon will rule the world. Cannot you uh, settle the little disputes between thyself and another when you're going to have such tremendous responsibilities to pour it out and rule over very quickly now in a matter of months, not years, because it's coming very, very soon. Now what's he done as far as putting you up over nations and kingdoms to do these things, to root out? Don't you want to get the roots out? Why, you can cut the branches all year long and every year of your life, but if you ever dug out the roots, you never bothered with that particular plant, shrub, tree, weed again. Root out, pull down. Now, sometimes you have to reach up to touch the bottom. I know that, but when you're way down, you still have to reach up and pull down things that ought not to be there. And that includes the casting down of imagination. And then to destroy. Now, that's still a negative word, rooting up and pulling down and destroying. But then again, for this cause was the Son of Man manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The reason you are called to destroy is because there's a kingdom of hell that you're combating, and this is why you have weapons. Weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. So whatever you do, have on the whole armor. Amen. And to throw down. Now, you have to be up to throw down. You have to be down to pull down. Would you like to get on the mountaintop? Let's get on top of this thing. And then when you get on top of it, when you start throwing things, you can throw them down, but you can't throw them down until you are first up. Say amen. Now the negatives are over. Now the positives. To build. Oh, to build and to plant. Now this is why God gives you weapons to destroy, but he gives you tools to build with. We are on one hand destroying hell. On the other hand, we are building the church. And to build has the connotation that it's already done, it's built, it's finished, it's the finished work. The instant work of God is the finished work. The instant work of God is a miracle. Amen. Hallelujah. And to plant means to put the seed in and to begin. And the healings are gradual, progressive restorations. They just start now. That's the planting. But when you finish the job, that's the building you've built. Amen. I'm covering a little passage here. I, I, I know that you will have to concentrate because we're going to get into some depth here tonight and we're going to see just about where you are in school. Hallelujah. Thank God. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? Now remember, Jeremiah has just been called to his particular ministry, which was that of a prophet. Now, what are you called to? Whatever it is, you're having success with it and you're ordained to do it by virtue of the fact that you're having results. You're having success. So that proves you're ordained to it. Now, he's been called to his particular ministry, and all of a sudden God says, I'm going to make a seer out of you. Start looking. See what you see. What do you see, said the Lord? Now, a seer is one who sees. Hello. Wondering why the preacher still bends his ear at the close of 1988. He still listens for a response. Amen. Oh, my, oh my one of them will fix you. The microphone uh, is real portable again tonight. We can come down and pick out the quiet spot, please. The cord is so long that nobody in the building can escape us this evening. Isn't that a happy thought? Now, normally it's not my style to be up here behind this pulpit, but I haven't memorized the whole chapter one of Jeremiah just yet. What are you seeing? I see, said Jeremiah, the, what looks like the rod of an almond tree. Very good, said God. You saw right. You saw it perfectly. I commend you. Not very often God commends the seer. He sees a lot of things sometimes he don't even want to see. And God says, Thou hast well seen, for I'll hasten my word to perform it. Now the Lord tests him again and asks him what he sees the next time, and this time 
he sees something, he doesn't get a, a commendation for it particularly. After all, you don't have to be patted on the back every time you do something right. Hmm? Why, that, that might cause you to wear your feelings on your sleeve. They didn't pat you on the back, you'd quit the church or something. The word of the Lord came to me the second time and said, Now what do you see? He said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Lord, I thank you tonight for the reading of this word. Let it be rich and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierced now to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and be a discerner of the thoughts and intents of every heart in this place tonight. Amen. Now we're getting ready to declare the word. Aren't you glad? What is more so important is that let him who thinketh he is spiritual admit, said Paul, that the things I teach and say unto you are the truth. And if you want to know who's of God, I can tell you in two seconds who's of God and who's not of God here tonight. You know how I know? Bible, scripture, word that cannot be broken. He that is of God, repeat it with me, he that is of God, heareth God's word. If you ain't got time for preaching, you can't stand preaching, especially when it comes to righteous principle, uh, you're going through a play act, churchianity and religiosity. He that's of God, hear of God's word, and he that won't listen to the word of God is not of God, according to the scripture, no matter who the name is, or what position they hold. There's nothing more important than this tonight. You've got somebody pulling the wool over your eyes if they won't listen to the word of God. Uh, amen. Now, I feel real good. I want to catch you up on what we've been doing. The past year and a half, we've been in six different denominations, and every one of those denominations wants us to go totally in their denomination and work with them, but we can't do that because we can only do what God sends us to, to the churches he sends us to, and to the people he sends us to. It's as big a surprise to me that I'm here tonight as it is to you. I had no idea that I'd be here two, three days ago, but here we are. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. Thank God. I don't know if we'll do it again this year, but we're doing it tonight. Therefore, let us squeeze every ounce of juice out of everything that God gives us for everything that's worth. Hallelujah. This is what's been happening. Uh, we have seen a tremendous breakthrough in the power of the demonstration. I have gone to meetings this past year in, in huge churches of, of various groups that are starving to death to see the power of the demonstration of God. And uh, I have no occasion to, to lie, and I wouldn't you know I'm not a braggart, and uh, all I can tell you is that uh, it has been something else. I've been moving into the specifics of names, which I've had people fasting and praying by the tens of thousands, and every church we go we get people to pray five minutes a week for this ministry. That's the biggest thing that I receive out of those churches, more than offerings, more than uh, memories or anything else. I can't even remember what happens the next morning. There's so much crammed in this head. I, I've seen God do so many things. And I have uh, uh, noticed in the last two years that power over blindness and all levels of uh, impaired vision, if God leads us to pray for eyes, there's always a change. Always a change to the perfect, to the embitterment. And uh, very recently, I have noticed that even in praying for short legs, as uh, criticized as that particular ministry has been over the years, I have watched it begin to happen on a consistent basis. And I only talk about things that are proven, and I've watched them for a while, and I've seen it starting to happen. And there are people that are starved to death for the power of God and have never seen it. They claim they believe it. They claim to be apostolic, and they don't even have an apostle in the ranks. And yet when it begins to happen, they'd be liars and hypocrites if they denied it because they have claimed to believe it all their life and they're finally getting a chance to see some of it. I would spend half the year in foreign countries if I could afford to do it. I have to do it on my own, financing myself when I do do it. It will cost me $7,000 to go to uh, India and be out of meetings five weeks and uh, paying the ticket and all the expense that it's going to be to live for five weeks in a heathen country. But God told me to go. And I'm going to go. It will happen. It will work out. 
I don't question that. I've, call, I've got calls to go to England, Sweden, Thailand, Venezuela, Argentina, and Chile powering up, backing up right now, that I will get to go when God makes the way. And if I could, I'd be there half the year because this, it's going to be very difficult to have revival in this country. We're having it, but it's going to be a difficult thing. It's going to cost a price. It's going to cost something to have revival in this country. Uh, supporting the gospel does not particularly exist in this country anymore. There are evangelists that are now getting their support out of South America and other countries and nations. And the media, the television media, is not going to preach the gospel anymore in this country. People are not particularly going to support it in this country. I'm not giving you a negative picture. I'm only giving you a prophecy here tonight. But there is a move of God in heathen lands and other countries in a marvelous way. God is going to give everybody his chance in the sun. Every puppy is going to have his day. Everybody's going to get a whack at it. Everybody's going to get an opportunity to hear the gospel and see the demonstration of God, which is why I would just as soon be in these nations myself, and I will go as much as I can. Are you listening close? Are you happy? And one of the hardest places you're going to see revival fall will be the state of Florida. You hear what I'm saying? There's going to be a lot of pseudo Pentecostalism. There's going to be a lot of hype and a lot of talk and a lot of people claim and do a lot of things by trickery and gimmickry, but genuine, old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival that requires Bible doctrine and Bible righteousness and holiness is absent, and it makes it that much more difficult to have a revival in spite of people. Now, I'd like to treat for a moment here the difference between a sovereign move of God and a gift of God. Would you like to know what, what the difference is? Since the turn of this century, 1906, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost this past uh, uh, 80 years, it has been God breaking through in spite of you. A sovereign move of God is when God moves and man don't know what's going on. Like Azusa Street, like uh, uh, out here in the, uh, Topeka. And in the various places where the power of God fell, people prayed, and God honored the seed of faith. He honored the seed of uh, preaching the word. He honored the seed of the word. And uh, people fasted. He honored fasting and seeking God and the hunger. But they still didn't know what was going on. It was a breakthrough that happened in spite of people. They didn't know when it happened, why it happened, when, where it happened, how it happened or how it would happen again, and they hoped it would happen again, but they couldn't quite get a handle on it. Or they couldn't duplicate it. They couldn't repeat it. We, somebody was healed last year. We hope to God it happens next year. See? All right, that's a sovereign move of God, and history has been riddled with sovereign moves of God. But concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Do you want to know who is the most ignorant people in the world concerning spiritual gifts? It's right there in that scripture. Paul was teaching. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, it's the brethren. Now, if the brethren are ignorant of spiritual gifts, what's the poor people in the congregation going to do? Say amen. When we stand before God Almighty, we're going to be judged on two counts, by your word and by your deed. Nothing more, nothing less. In fact, you can judge yourself by that little black book we're preaching out of, sitting in your lap right now. If you judge yourself by the Word, you'll not be judged before God. But that Word says, by word and by deed, what you say and what you do. You're not responsible for anything more than that. And yet you cannot preach the Word of God and not back it up with deeds and works. To talk the power of God is only half the job. It's a chicken with one wing flying in a circle. Two wings. Word. And deed, your works prove your faith. Your legs are put to your prayers. Your body and your soul makes a combination of an existent human. So I say, you can't just talk words. You've got to back it up with deeds. You'll be judged for the lack of deeds. There are sins of commission. That's the things you commit. Then there are sins of omission, things you omit, what you leave out and you do not do. Amen. Are you happy? 
So a sovereign move of God is God breaking through in spite of it. But the gift of God is when a man or woman operates with his or her God. Watch this. God moves, you move. God steps, your step. He speaks, you speak. He acts, you act. It's two worlds paralleling, working side by side. Again, trying to expect a sovereign move of God is just the chicken of the one wing. You've got one world doing it all, and the other world's sitting uh, on a pew somewhere trying to warm it, hatching eggs. Amen. The sovereign move is not enough. The gift of God is when you operate with God. You see, the parallel of both worlds working together is so necessary for balance that God can only go so far until you do your part and do your obedience. For instance, the Egyptians are all around us. Moses, what do we do? We don't know what to do. You don't know what to do, don't do nothing. It's not your turn, it's God's turn. God's got to move now, because you don't know what to do. We've got people that blow their brains out and just work themselves to a lather and a foam and a frenzy, trying to figure out what to do. So they do everything they can think of when they're not supposed to be doing a thing. They're supposed to be standing still and seeing the salvation of God. What are we going to do, Moses? You don't know what to do? Don't do nothing. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It's God's turn. Lord, what are we going to do? Speak to the people that they go forward. Stick your foot in it. But see, most folks don't have no trouble doing that. So they stuck their foot in the Red Sea, and they thought it was going to be cold and deep and wet and clammy and creepy and scary, but uh, God sent a wind and parted it. They walked through dry shore. Then when they stuck their foot in it by going forward, God says, my turn, I'll pass the waters with the east wind. Now it's your turn. Walk through the water. Now it's my turn. Now that you're on the east bank, I'll put the waters together and drown the Egyptians for you. Now it's your turn. Get your tambourines and start shouting and singing and dancing on the east bank of the sunny uh, banks of God's deliverance. God's turn, your turn, God's turn, your turn. His step, your step, his step, your step. That is a gift of God, two worlds paralleling and working together. As opposed to people sitting around, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for a sovereign move. I was zapped two years ago. I hope I get zapped again. You have got to take the initiative and put your foot forward and work with God and move with God. That's a gift of God as opposed to the sovereign move of God. We've been 28 years pounding the highways right on. We don't want nobody's sympathy. We don't have a hard luck story to tell. But there's a great price that's involved with that. It always used to be that preachers, pastors, screen evangelists. Now I'm an evangelist that screens pastors. I won't even preach for a pastor if he's not worthy. Right. That must tell you something about why I'm here. Say amen. I don't even have time. There are kids out running the roads and I'll be in church. Amen. Don't, don't have time to uh, fool for preachers that don't have his house in order and his wife won't go to church and here he's going to church trying to have revival in the church. Say amen. I mean, I'm all down fooling around with it. I just as soon take it and heave it. Right. I'm going to see righteous principle or know the reason why. And do you know what? God has backed me up on it and I know it's one of the reasons why I've thrust into a greater depth in the spirit. Say amen. I'm sick and tired of compromise, and I'm never going to do it again. You've heard old brother Freddie say it tonight. Say amen. Things have got to be right, or I'm not going to bother with it. Do you know if your fruit don't remain, there is no reward in heaven for it? And why should I just do this for a living? I'm not doing this for a living. This is a life with me. This is me. I'm called to this. I have no choice. I must do this. And when I stand before God and I say, Lord, uh, thanks for the reward, but what about these other things I did? He's going to say, well, where's the fruit? I said, well, we got the fruit. Well, it didn't remain. Why didn't it remain? Somebody didn't hang on to it and nurture it. I can only get the fruit. It's up to other folks to maintain the fruit and nurture the fruit and keep the fruit. I have to do the work of evangelist. I am a bulldozer. I'm a pioneer. I'm a trailblazer. I, I sometimes rush in with angels' spirit tread. And they begrudgingly have to go in there with me because they're assigned to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. But dead men feel nothing. You can kick a corpse all day and he'll never know you're doing it to him. He, he, he don't feel it. 
And when you totally die, you will obey God. And when you're not dead, you will not obey God. You've got to die first to obey Him. Hallelujah. So that's the way it works. And so I'm after fruit tonight, and I believe God's going to help even the pastor of this church, dear old Brother C, to maintain it and that it might remain so that he and I both will reap a reward and you can reap a reward with it by uh, cooperating. As it's given to you, you give it to others. Say amen. But don't expect a reward for that which does not remain. This is why the Bible said, You've not chosen me, I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatsoever you ask the Father in my name is. Now, he became king, and after he was king for two years, he decides to take on the whole Philistine army. Well, how many men you got, Saul? I got 2,000, and my boy, Jonathan's got 1,000. You're a novice. You better go home and hide under the bed for a while. Say amen. Now, I've seen a strange thing under the sun, said Solomon. I see servants riding and princes walking. Chew on it. Does that mean... People have no business usurping reins of authority and leadership or up there trying to do it, riding while princes are on the ground walking. You see that? Now that's exactly what has happened. As someone gets a, a wild uh, dream and he starts pursuing it. He doesn't wait to be called. He doesn't even wait on his ministry. He just goes out and he builds crowds and he builds buildings, but he has not built the church. Say amen. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I have not sent these prophets, yet they read. I have not spoken to them, but yet they say, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. It's a fearful thing to say, Thus saith the Lord. Yet had they waited in my presence, I would have spoken to them. Had they spent time waiting on me and seeking my face, I would have sent them. God is not fussy who he uses, but uh, you've got to get enough of God to be used. Say hey, amen. Hey, well, thank the Lord. Now, here's Saul. He's going to take on the Philistines. And when he challenges the devil, which is the Philistines, lo and behold, he finds out that there's uh, uh, 30,000 footmen, 10,000 chariots. I mean, he's so outnumbered that he's got himself in a mess. Did you know what Paul said about a novice? Don't be a novice. That's being lifted up with pride. You fall into the condemnation of the devil. A novice will get puffed up and proud and all heated up and uh, stuck upon himself to such a point that he'll fall into condemnation every time. Every time you see him when he should be up on the mountain, he's condemned. He's always accepting flattery and a pat on the back and his head swelling. He's scratching clear out here. Oh, I've really uh, done something great. Next thing, the novice gets lifted up with his pride. And every time you get lifted up with pride, poof, you fall into condemnation of the devil because it's the devil's work and it's his business. It's his job. Well, you your hand in victory. Hallelujah. Are you happy? Let everyone that needs this say amen. Now, here's how we preach. We preach till it hurts. And then we keep on preaching until it quits hurting. That's how it works. Hallelujah. After a while, they shuffle and they get red-faced and embarrassed. Ooh, oh, that's rough. Back off, Brother Freddy, back off. After a while, they, it, it kills them dead. They die out totally. And then, hey, I'm starting to feel better now that you, you can't kill a Christian or destroy a soul. All death results in a resurrection. Hey, a brand new you is coming out of the pew. A brand new you is coming out of that body. And then suddenly you start feeling good, saying, hey, you know, this is what I needed all the time. Lay it on me, preacher. Lay it on me. I've been needing this. Hallelujah. Uncle Shia Bahatra. Woo. Oh, glory. Thank God. All right. Saul cannot handle it, so he's in a box. And he does not know what to do, so he calls for a prophet. Everybody wants to see a prophet when they're in trouble. But when things are smooth and they're partying, brother, don't let no prophet knock on my door. He's sure enough will ruin my party. Hallelujah. So he's in trouble. He calls for Samuel. Samuel sends word and says, wait seven days. Now, several can't wait seven seconds. They've got to have it right now. Oh, God, i got two minutes. Can you bless me in two minutes? Mm -hmm. now, there's a price involved in this. You pay the price, you get just what it is, unless you want sway to Pentecostalism. Unless you want sleight of hand in a gimmick in some hyped-up innuendo that's not even true, palmed off on you. 
as being the great power of God. And some folks, the dear souls, don't know the difference because they've never been allowed to see the great power of God. Preacher told them they had a great move of God. Well, we had a great move of God. Well, I don't told everybody had a great move of God, and they've never seen a great move of God. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Wait seven days, and I'll come down, and I'll sacrifice. And then the Lord will deliver you. While old legalistic Saul counted off the seconds and the minutes. Tick, 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 tick. One, two, three, four, five, six days. Right. We're in the seventh day. Oh, he's got to come. He's got to come. I'm in such a mess. He should have had it. He got himself in the mess. Therefore, he should listen to the word of God. But he waited legalistically right to the seventh day and said, all right, time's up. He didn't come. I'm not obligated. It don't have to happen that way. I'll offer the sacrifice myself. This is called the premature ministry. Now, may I say that a ministry, a real ministry is a sacrifice. It's not just time, energy, and finance, brother. It's a sacrifice. There's a big price tag that goes with it. When you talk about ministry, you're not talking about fun and games. You're talking about sacrifice. So sacrifice and ministry in your mind tonight in this message should be synonymous. Sacrifice and ministry. It was called the premature ministry. Seven days are up. Where is Saul? Or, or Samuel, says Saul. He's not here. I'm going to do it myself. Are you now? All right? So here is Saul offering up the sacrifice. Now, do you know that most people will accept fact and, and confuse it with faith. Well, the preacher told me this, that, and that, and the other, and it's true, so I have faith. No, you have facts. You already knew those facts. You already knew it was true. Sometimes I prayed for sisters that I said, you're suffering here in your stomach, and it's, it's right there. She said, no, it isn't. It's right there. I said, now, sir, don't you know that God's trying to stretch your faith a little there's got to be a little part of you that can stretch and accept the unknown. If everything's a fact, I mean, there's no faith. You've got to accept something that you may have to reach for until it becomes substance and believe for until it becomes evidence and hang on for until it is materialized. So now, you are seeing Saul, he cannot wait one second beyond what he thought was seven days. Now, he offers a sacrifice called a premature ministry. Say it with me, premature ministry. And just as soon as he offers the sacrifice, who comes on the horizon, walking on the scene? Guess who? His name is Samuel. I salute you, Saul. I may not salute you when I find out what you've done. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt until I've checked you out. I salute you, Saul. I'm here to offer the sacrifice. But, but, but I just offered it. I, oh, you did? You jumped the gun, did you? The most exercise that anybody gets these days seems to be jumping to conclusions. Hallelujah. So you've jumped the gun. Hmm. If you'd have waited just a few moments, I'd have been here to do according to the will of God. Now you have done it ahead of time. Now, how many times... Have you got ready to do something in your life, an investment, a project, uh, a ministry, uh, something that you were to buy, and uh, just before you were to do the very dead center of the perfect will of God, just a few minutes before, a few days before, along comes the devil and throws you a curveball. <laughs> now, why don't you go out and speculate and try this, and by the time you've done this, that, and the other, and you've spent your money, you've spent your energy, you've spent your ambition, you've spent your zeal, you're exhausted, you're whipped, all of a sudden, along comes the thing that God wants you to do. See that? And here you was, not knowing what to do, spending your energies in all these directions, had you done nothing because you did not know what to do and realize it was God's turn and not yours. You'd have still had your strength and your money and your ambition and your where was all to do something when, bingo, the great moment came. See that? Now we're talking about ministry that is premature. Getting ahead of God. Everyone say it again, premature ministry. I hope to God that none of your ministries are premature or ever will be. And remember, everybody saved has a ministry. But I don't ever pastor a pulpit, Brother Freddie. You're right. Probably you won't. But that has nothing to do with ministry. People who are saved must preach, 
teach or witness. No choice, one of the three. If you intend to stay saved, you must keep on preaching, teaching, or witnessing. To give it away means God will give you more. To hoard it means that it'll get stale and stagnant and you lose what you think you got. So now we find everybody has a ministry. Hope to God it's not premature. Well, in this instance, I'd like to quote Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed unto this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may know, up here in this renewed mind, what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I'm not trying to tell you God split up in a dozen different wills, but there is the perfect will of God. It's best for you. Then there's that which is good. I've seen good things, and then I've seen perfect things. Hello? I've seen good things, and then I've seen acceptable things. Hello? Hmm? Things that God permits. He doesn't reject you. He doesn't forsake you. He puts up with it. He permits you to be in that stagnant rut. He permits you to uh, live in what is inferior. But he has a perfect will. And he's got a good will. And he's got that acceptable, permissive will. Don't you want the dead sinner, the perfect will of God for your life? How many would like to have that? Thank God. So now, a premature ministry is one thing, and this, this speaks of the good will. You see, God had good will toward Saul, even though he goofed up once. If you make the mistake once, you learn through it. Make the same mistake twice, you're not, you're not too bright. Make the same mistake the third time in a row, no hope for you. Are uh, you listening now? And yet, God in his mercy just goes over and over and over and over and picking people up 10,000 times in a row trying to have mercy on them. How long will it last? Amen. So God gives uh, Saul another chance, and of course Saul is in another predicament. He has been sent by Samuel, speaking God's mouth, peace to him, saying, Saul, go down and kill all the Malachites and destroy all of Amalek. See that this time you do things right, boy. I'll give you another chance. Get down and perform your ministry. Make the sacrifice. Sacrifice the whole thing. Oh, yes, sir, I'll do it right now, said old uh, uh, Saul. So he takes his army down there and he destroys Amalek, except he decides he knows more than God. You know, I've got uh, a little bit of reservation here. That's a fine-looking cow I might keep. And there's a fine-looking sheep I might keep. And oh, there's Agag. He speaks so delicately. He's the king. It's a shame to kill the king. People second-guessing God. I know what the Bible says, but don't you think that... Um, no, I don't even bother thinking when it comes to the Bible. If the Word of God says it, I don't try to find loopholes around it. Amen. So now Saul said, uh, Samuel said, I'll be down to visit you in your second ministry, Saul, and see how you did if you followed orders and performed your ministry properly. So here comes Samuel. Salute Saul. And Saul stands up, clears his throat, starts testifying. <clears throat> you know, some folks' testimony is quite the thing. Going in the midst of the testimony, there's always these strange sounds in the background. Testimonies full of holes and contradictions. And Did you do what you told in this ministry of sacrifice, old Saul? Oh, yes, we killed every Amalekite. We destroyed all the sinners. We've wiped it out. We've done a perfect job just like you told us and right in the midst of the testimony <laughs> what in the world is that said Samuel I'm trying to hear your testimony but what you are speaks so loud I can't hear a word you say hello what mean if this bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen if you've killed everything and destroyed it all oh uh, you see the, the people the people always got an excuse passing it off on the people the people wanted me to do this, and so the people forced me. I was under political pressure to do the will of the democracy. Why, in the first ministry, he said, I force myself, Samuel, if you have to force yourself to do something, it's the wrong thing to do. If you can't flow into it and be easily yielded to the Spirit, why then, you've got to force your way into it, why? I don't know if that's the will of God or not. If you have to put forth such a supreme effort and it won't work out, just stop. You don't know what you're doing. Stop. It's God's turn. When he moves, then it'll be your turn again. When it becomes your turn again, it'll work for you. 
Again, the gift of God is opposed to the sovereign move of God. See that? Amen? Are you getting this? Now this is going to, the Lord's given me this message, and it's, it'll get a little heavier here in just a few moments, so uh, stick some toothpicks in your brains and in your eyes. Say amen, and let's grasp it. Hallelujah. This is called the incomplete ministry. Well, what's incomplete? Well, he was sent to do a certain job, and he only did a partial job. He did the majority, but he left clauses and loopholes and this, that. He never completed what he was sent to do. There are people that never complete their ministry. Graveyards are filled tonight with preachers, teachers, and witnesses that should have lived long enough to finish their ministry. And they never did because there were certain stones unturned. There were certain things not rooted out, not pulled down, not thrown down, not destroyed. Say hallelujah. That's why when they built and they planted, it just didn't stand very long. And they should have finished their ministry, but too flimsy a habitation. A premature ministry. Now you have this uh, incomplete ministry. Now this speaks of the acceptable will, the permissive will, because God didn't really reject Saul, but he rejected him as king at this point. See, he could have had the kingdom, but now he had no kingdom. He just had his own soul. Yet your soul was that against the whole wide world, regardless of your kingdoms. So here's Saul, he, at least he has his soul, he's now moved into the permissive or acceptable will of God. And yet the third ministry had to be done by Samuel himself because Saul couldn't handle it. It was called the perfect will of God. Here came Samuel reigning, uh, uh, ordaining and anointing a new king. And he did it through sacrifice. How can I go to Jesse's house and raise up a new king? Take a sacrifice, said God. Take a heifer. So you're going to sacrifice. The third sacrifice, or the third ministry, was called the perfect timing ministry. You got it? Perfect timing ministry. All supernatural events are contingent upon the perfect timing of God. Timing is the key to every supernatural event. You can jump the God and be premature. You can drag your feet and be incomplete. Or you can move in the perfect timing. And when... Uh, Samuel went to Jesse's house with a heifer in one hand. Rise and fill your horn of oil. And he, in his other hand, he held a horn of oil. That meant the anointing was in one hand and the sacrifice was in the other hand. Now Saul couldn't kill him. Not a devil in hell can stop a man that's got the anointing in one hand and the sacrifice in the other hand who has gone in perfect timing to perform his ministry. He has not uh, jumped the gun prematurely. He's not dragged his tail in uh, incompletely. But now he's in perfect timing with the anointing in one hand and the sacrifice in, in the other. And this speaks not of the good will, not of the permissive will, but it speaks of the perfect will, the dead center of the perfect will of God. Now these are the three ministries in the life of Saul and Samuel. And let's correspond it now to the other text, way down in history, and to the life of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet of God. How many believe that? You believe that because it's in the Bible, and you believe the Bible. Not a word that he ever did his speech did, did ever hit the ground. It all came to pass. Why? Because as we read chapter 1 to you just a few moments ago, I knew you before you were formed in the belly. I sanctified you before you came out of the womb. I ordained you a prophet not just to uh, East 32nd Street of Tampa, but to the nations and to the kingdom. And whatever your ministry is that's bearing fruit and having results and success, it's not just to your little household, but it's to the nations and it's to the kingdoms. And if it'll work for your house, first, and it has to work for your house first, but then it'll work for every house in the world. Once you've proved it in your own house, it surely work anywhere else. Hallelujah. And I've sent you to people, and when you go to those people, you've got to tell them everything I command you, no matter how it hair lips the devil, no matter how it ruffles fur and rubs fur the wrong way and goes against the grain and upsets the apple cart. You've got to tell them what I command you. And don't you worry about it not being my words, because I'm going to touch your mouth right now, and every word i comes out as words I put in it. And then I will deliver you from the people as long, as long as you're not afraid of the faith. Be not dismayed at their faces, or farther into chapter 1, I didn't get clear down through the chapter, he said, I will confound you before them. Now when we face people to pray for them, 
Are we going to be confounded before them? Not if we're not dismayed at the face. When we face people to give them the word of the Lord, are we going to be delivered from those same people that could rise up and act like a cat on a hot tin roof? Not if we're not afraid of their faces. God said he would deliver you from the people. Then he would deliver the people from whatever afflicted them. Say amen. All glory. What am I saying here? I'm saying that he was called to this ministry. It's just like Samuel going to Jesse's house with the sacrifice and with the anointing. And, uh, that's called a prophet with his hands full. I've been to many a meeting where I looked out over the crowds of the Lord. We've got our hands full tonight. Look at this bunch. Hallelujah. But if the anointing's in one hand and the sacrifice is in the other, nothing will stop you or kill you or keep you from raising up and ordaining and anointing people as kings, if you please. Don't you know we're called to be kings and priests unto God? Hallelujah. Here's Jeremiah, many centuries later, doing the same thing. God is faithful in every generation to raise up people with ministries and whatever he's ordained them to do, they will successfully perform it. So here they come. Hmm. Hmm. Jeremiah is going to do everything God tells him. He says, I promise. I'm a child. Don't say you're a child. I have made you a man and caused you to grow up. Hallelujah. Piping and dancing no more. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here came Jeremiah. Now he gets into some heavy stuff. He, of course, is operating in, again, the permissive will of God. See the parallel in the correspondence? The corresponding parallel. As the first ministry of Saul was goodwill, then the second failure was permissive, and Samuel's performance was perfect, so was Jeremiah's performance perfect, but then the first thing he saw in the Spirit spoke of the goodwill again, and the second thing he saw spoke of the permissive or the fairly acceptable will again. Now let's consider the two things he saw. First he saw the rod of an almond tree, and then he saw a seething pot facing the north. This is very important to understand this. Don't you want to do your ministry? Be like Jeremiah. Be like Samuel. It may not be easy, but as long as you're saving souls, you can't backslide. As long as you're healing, folks, you're going to pretty well stay in, in pretty good health. God's going to need you to keep on healing, folks. As long as you're praying, folks, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, how are you going to not be filled yourself? He that teacheth others, teachest thou not also thyself? It's impossible for me to pray, pay, pray people through the Holy Ghost and not speak in tongues with them. Husbandman is the first protector of the fruit. Say amen. Now how can I stay sanctified if I'm praying folks through to being sanctified? You see what I mean? It's self-feeding. One causes the other to happen. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Are you glad here on Christmas night? Wonderful Jesus. Thank my God. I love him. I see a rod of an almond tree. You saw well, said God. He commended him. Now, if you won't do your ministry, this message is telling us here, then you'll receive correction. You will receive the rod. You will get the rod of the almond tree. Now, at least the rod will produce some almonds. At least when pressure is put on the tree, we'll find out what kind of tree it is. There was an argument about who was going to be high priest. And God said, I'll tell you who I've called, and I'll prove you who I've called. Every one of you take a stick and lay it up in the tabernacle overnight. One for every tribe, all 12 tribes. Now, it's pretty hard sometimes to find out what your fruit's going to be if you can't lay up in the tabernacle overnight. Amen. Well, I, I want to get home and watch pistol smoke. You may never know what your fruit's going to be. That rod never budded till morning. But in the morning, buds came on it. Then came blossom, and then came fruit. And I know some of you are budding right now. You're budding prospects for God. In fact, I feel buds coming out all over my mortal body. Hallelujah. You have a quickened who was dead in trespasses and sin. And when you feel the Spirit of God entwining with your spirit, that's not goose pimples, chills, thrills, thrills. That is a quickening of the mortal body by the Holy Ghost. Buds. But no matter how quick and budding you are, you have yet to blossom. And when you blossom, you smell good. And you look good. And you look the part. You are a blossoming candidate for God's best. 
we still don't know who you are because blossoms don't mean nothing. Unless you're a real horticulturist, you won't know what that blossom really is until the fruit forms. And when the fruit forms, budding, blossoming, fruit, by that fruit you should know them. You will know what kind of tree is by the fruit. Now, you might be the poorest discerner of spirits in the world, but if you can be a good fruit inspector, it'll do the very same job. You can't get peaches off a pear tree. And Jesus said you won't get grapes off of thorns, and you won't get figs off of thistles. You just can't do that because that's not the plant, but it is. So in the morning, it was Aaron's rod that budded almonds meant high priest. Now, had it been pumpkins, it might have meant prophet. I don't know why almonds meant high priest, but God said, if it's almonds, that's my high priest. It was almonds in the morning. And, and when I look at your fruit, I can tell you just what you're supposed to be doing. Who can argue with results? You can argue the means and the method, but you can't argue the results. You must believe for the work's sake, said Jesus. Now, whatever you do, do not criticize the means and the methods by which God uses somebody because you're sowing a problem that you're going to reap. Because just the day God starts to use you, if he ever does, you're going to have the same old holocaust come down your back that you put on somebody else criticizing them. If God ever uses you, you're going to wind up getting criticized to no end for the means and the methods that, by which he uses you. Because God's not going to use everybody the same way because no two snowflakes are the same. They are different. Everything, everybody's different. And if you yourself, God uses you. And if you're trying to be a copycat of somebody else that you like, we already got one of him. And he's hard enough to swallow. If we can't stand the original, we sure are not going to swallow the reasonable facsimile. <laughs> you hearing me now? Say, I love you, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> the rod... Don't talk to me about the rod. Well, then do your ministry. Now, the rod of the, the foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now, you see, if you're not going to minister, which keeps you automatically straight, you're going to have to sit there and take the rod until the almond begins to form upon the tree. Can you see that? You know the difference between shepherds and sheep? Shepherds tend sheep, they uh, feed sheep, they water sheep, they break their leg when they run away. Hello. Uh, they take oil and dump it on the ram's horn so that when the old ram gets in a big fight, it just bounces off and they don't harm each other. Thou anointest my head with oil. Hello. I see somebody's brain ought to get anointed with oil here right about now. I said, get your head anointed with oil so you can understand what I'm saying. Say hey, amen. Shepherds take care of sheep. That sheep are just bad, bad. Take care of me. Take care of me. Feed me. Fleece me. Uh, keep me from going off the deep end or over the precipice. That's the difference between shepherds and sheep. I'm saying there's a difference between ministering and just sitting there saying, well, Brother Freddie, do whatever you got to do to get me out of this chair. I'm just an old dry sponge. I'm here to soak up every ounce of life you've got in you if you've got any left. Say, well, that's the person that goes into the good will of God. Not the perfect will. He's in, the, he's in a good will, but uh, he's getting the rod. Because if you don't minister like Jeremiah, you're going to see the rod of an almond tree. Because Jeremiah saw it for all who were not doing like he was doing. Do you understand that? But the rod of the almond tree is at least better than the seasoning pot. I mean, this is like jumping out of the fire, uh, frying pan into the fire. It's going to bad the worst when you go from a rod of an almond tree to a seasoning pot facing the north. Because the seasoning pot is facing judgment. N judgment comes out of the north. God's throne is in the north. Mount Palomar, California had a, has a great telescope that spotted a four-square star coming through the north. It was not round, it was square, and they predicted it would be close to the earth in a thousand years. They are right about on target. Because the new Jerusalem, the city that sits four square, sits upon the earth at the end of the thousand years of the millennial reign, not the beginning. It's only after the thousand years that God renovates heaven and earth, gives us a new earth, and puts new Jerusalem on it. Hello. It's coming down. It's coming down out of the north part. What got Lucifer cast out of heaven? I will climb into the side of the north and put my throne above the stars of God, and I'll be God. You'll be nothing, said God. And he threw him down from the north. 
heaven's coming. New Jerusalem's coming down from the north. God's throne is in the north, and that's why the devil gets in the north and tries to play God. He's always trying to uh, palm himself off as some godly thing and get all God's worship and glory and honor. Always trying to play God. So the north is a very strategic battleground, just like Jerusalem in the Middle East is, which is the capital of God upon earth, upon the planet where he's put his name there. Okay? All right. Hallelujah. If judgment is coming out of the north and God does not curse you, but he backs off and the devil curses you, God does not make you sick, but sometimes uh, uh, he does not totally protect you and he'll allow the devil to make you sick. I don't say God will tempt you because no man can be tempted of God. God tempts no man. You're tempted when you're drawn away of your own lust, said James. See what comes out of the matter. God will give permission, but the devil, uh, the devil does things that are destructive and negative. You see that? All right. Jeremiah does his ministry. Not an easy ministry, but he does it. Folks that won't do the ministry of Jeremiah will be recipients and candidates for the rod of the almond tree. That's what I see. Can you see that too? Good. Then you are a seer. A seer, again, is one who sees. And now, there are those that go into the acceptable, the permissive, the uh, least of all will of God, and that's those seething parts. Ooh, oh, I'm so aggravated, I'm so upset, I'm so disturbed and frustrated and seething. If I could just get my hands on so-and-so's neck, I'd wring it. One thing about a seething pot, uh, what is in the pot is contained within the pot. Somehow God keeps it from splashing over and affecting other folks. And I don't want to be contained, I want to break out of the pot. I want to be filled to the overflow cup and saucer too. Seething in the pot, some people will take the rod and go back to the ministry of Jeremiah. Other people will not take the rod and start seething and fuming, rejecting and rebelling and uh, thinking they know more than God. And nobody knows any more than what the Word of God teaches and preaches. I mean, we're all Johnny comes lately, but this thing has been written from the foundation. I mean, it's been proven never to return void or to fail, and just because uh, we're not in the mood does not give us a license to reject the Word of God. And the Word of God said that Saul's ministry was just a little too quick. We don't want jiffy, quickie religion. See? Premature, just before they're going to do the thing God wants them to do, they spend all their energies doing something stupid. Amen. And they should have just waited five more minutes. His ministry would have been in perfect timing. That's called premature. And then we have his second ministry and effort, which was incomplete. Well, I forgot to do this, but I didn't do that. Well, there are sins of omission, which you omit. Now, if there's anything worse than a premature ministry, it's an incomplete ministry. It was mature, but it got a little bit too lazy in the rocking chair and didn't cover every base and didn't cover every loophole and do everything it was supposed to do. See? And now along comes uh, Samuel, and he does it in perfect time, and it was a sacrifice, and with the anointing, he gets to Jesse's house right on time, and anoints a new king. <laughs> now in Jeremiah's life, it was the same way. We have Jeremiah doing the ministry in reverse here, like Saul, or Samuel did, when he went to Jesse's house. Jeremiah does his ministry, and he does it as God calls him for 50-some chapters. But then there's people that get the rod of the almond tree, because Jeremiah's taught. And the only reason that you'd have to have a rod come upon you is because you're not doing your ministry. But if you do it, you won't be in that second category. You'll be in Jeremiah's category. And if you won't do what God has ordained you to do, no matter if it's just sweep the pew or sweep the floor. Amen. Then comes the rod of correction and the rod of the almond tree, and sometimes he chastens us, lest we be somebody else's son. But when he chastens us, it's to pr produce fruit. The scripture said, and no chastening for the moment seemed pleasant but grievous, but afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Amen. And all right, those who will not accept the rod and go back, if they accept the rod, they go back to the ministry. If they do not accept the rod, they go on to the next vision that the fear saw, the vision of the season part. And let's not get fuming and 
frustrated and all boiling over and just agitated within ourselves because we'll just destroy ourselves. It's contained within the pot. It's all in here. Uh, you can fume and fuss to doomsday and it's not going to affect me. It's just going to rot you away inside like a cancer. And this is what uh, Jesus told John's disciples. He said, go tell John in the jail. He, his gift didn't fail him. He did on, endorse the right Messiah. This is what he's looking for. I don't care how discouraged he is. The greatest prophet ever lived is John the Baptist, and yet he doubted in his heart one morning. Go and show John again. The blind see, the, the deaf uh, hear, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. If you can just get over your offenses, you can be blessed. But if you're offended in Jesus, anything he does, anything he says, remember, words and deeds are the two things by which you will be judged. Whatever he wants to say, whatever he wants to do, if that offends you, then offensive people are those who harbored offenses at one time in their life. And offenses have uh, 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 festered and, and cankered and they're just all corruptible. And it, only because you allowed yourself to be offended. Pull out the offense. It'll take its corruption with it. And therefore you will no longer be offensive, which is the uh, root word of offense. Offense is the root word of offensiveness. See that? It works that way. So now, we will not be a seething pot. Amen. That would be the lowest of the wills. I want to be in the highest of the will of God. The highest form of the will of God is what I want. Yet, seething pots sit all over churches all over the land, just seething away because they're facing judgment. And it's coming out of the north. It's coming from God, who is allowing the devil to do it to him. The devil is kind of, kind of hard the place of the north, too. Whenever you see a seething pot facing the north, you know they're going to have judgment for, for too long. Ever see a haughty spirit? It's going to fall. You ever see pride? It's going to go on to destruction. Ever see a novice lifted up? He's going to fall into condemnation. He's about to be cut short because he's facing the north and he's seething in his pot. Hallelujah. Let's back up and receive the rod of an almond tree. Huh? <laughs> be a tree planted by water bearing root downward and fruit upward not, shall not be moved glory to God in fact let's get all the way back to the ministry of Jeremiah and go to whoever God tells us be not afraid of the faces be not dismayed speak every word he commands you and God will deliver you from them and he'll not confound you before them and he said I'll make you an iron pillar don't you want to be one this is Jeremiah chapter 1 right on I will make you a defense city I will make you a brazen wall. Someone could ask for trouble, Brother Freddie. Sometimes you get too brazen. That's all right. I'm a brazen wall tonight. Hallelujah. I'm an iron pillar. I'm not a plaster of Paris pillar. Oh, backbone, not a wishbone. Let's get an iron rod in your spine. Hallelujah. A defense city. Let's not be a city that all its defenses have broken down. That defense, that city cannot hold its own, much less have revival within the midst thereof. Hallelujah. So I wanted to show you tonight the uh, life of uh, Saul in light of the doctrine of Jeremiah. It was worlds apart, many generations apart. They never saw each other's day, but that only proves that righteous law and principle exist throughout history. Throughout every generation, God's laws never change. Truth endures. Hallelujah. So everybody say, premature ministry, incomplete ministry, perfect timing ministry. Let's skip over to Jeremiah and say, ordained ministry, rod of an almond tree ministry, seizing pot ministry. Let's all quote that verse in finality tonight together Romans 12 to be not conformed unto this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind has your mind been renewed tonight have you know have you learned anything do you know anything now that ye may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God there's three levels of the will of God right there premature incomplete and perfect timing hmm ordained rod of the almond tree 
and seething pot. Now there's the two parallels of the life of Saul in the light of the doctrine of Jeremiah. Hallelujah. Now how many received something tonight? Did you get your soul fed over that? Hallelujah. Go ahead and let's praise God together. Let's pray a first prayer tonight for your ministry. We'll pray a mass prayer and then we'll pray in specifics on the individual basis, no doubt. And we will go to the people God sent us and speak what he commands us. And we will not be afraid of your faith. How many knows that? Hallelujah. That way God will deliver me from you. And then he'll deliver you from your problem. Say hallelujah. Oh, and he'll not confound me before you. The thing about Samuel and Jeremiah that they had in common was not a word they ever prophesied ever hit the ground. It came to pass. Somebody said, I know something you prophesied, Brother Freddy. It didn't happen. You bite your tongue. You have no right to say it didn't happen. You only have a right to say, hey, it has not happened yet. Nobody put the day and the hour and the date on it because no man knows the day and the hour, the Bible says. If you're honest and faithful, you'll live to see the hour and the day when it happens in your life. And you say, I remember when that was prophesied. Say amen. Lift your hands, let's pray for your ministries. Oh, Jesus, there are hungry folks here tonight, and they are tired of sitting on the stool of doing nothing. They want to stir themselves and to accomplish more. I know that a lot of them are weak, tired, and exhausted, frustrated. Some of them might be even seizing. Some of them might even be underneath the rod. Some of them may not even know what the fruit is on their tree. Oh, God, some of them may be premature. They haven't waited on you long enough. Some of them have been sent forth and haven't done a very good job. It's been a shoddy job. They've been incomplete. They have left a few things undone that you've commanded them to do. And the gifts and callings without repentance. And they're going to have to do it before they die if they expect heaven to be their home. Oh, Lord, no matter what the weakness and the flaws and the holes in these ministries are, standing here tonight, patch them up and change them. Give them ministries of Samuel and Jeremiah. Give them perfect timing ministries. Let them be ordained of God to be doing whatever they're doing, and they'll know it by the fruit thereof, by their successes. O oh God of living hosts, I beseech thee by the sure mercies of David that you'll give people renewed ministries, honed ministries, quickened. Don't let them be discouraged by missing it and making mistakes. God encourage them now raise them up and let them try again and not be faint-hearted because the next time it's going to work that which is first is natural that which is second is spiritual the first time is a failure a trial run they learn to it but the second time they try the same thing it'll be successful it'll be permanent it'll be eternal it'll work for them god help them tonight to get back on the horse that threw them Help them tonight to pull themselves back out of the ditch of failure, wipe themselves off, and try again. And the second time will be spiritual. It'll really work the next time. God, pack up every hole and every ministry that's here tonight. And every failure, overlook it and forgive it and bury it and remove it. And Lord, you can't help those who won't help themselves. So we're going to try to help ourselves by trying again. And God's going to make it work by doing it again successfully this time in our life. Hallelujah for ministries, O oh God, that are raised up on a mass prayer, mass miracle, as a whole, and a general collective group, we've prayed for every ministry that it'll be complete, that it'll be mature, that its timing will be perfected, or that it will be ordained, that it will accept the rod of any correction until the fruit is formed. And even if they're a seasoned pot, help them to come back into the ministry of Jeremiah. Don't let them face judgment. God, let them fix it up and patch it up. And Like the steward in Luke chapter 16, let them balance their books, O oh God, before judgment strikes. Don't let them use up grace period. Don't let them use up space to repent. God, give them space. Give them grace. O oh, great grace. He call up Oshah until Jeremiah's are weeping prophets all over this church, until Samuel's are filled with anointing in one hand and the sacrifice in the other hand all over this church. Oh God, I thank you for these ministries. It's high time, oh God, that we've been doing more than what we've done. Hallelujah. Give us the power and the strength and the capability and the spirit to do it. Encourage us. Give us back the ambition to perform it. I thank you, O oh God, that you're doing it. Rikosha Kabadra. 
and everyone said, praise my God, it's happening. Oh, glory to God. Wonderful, wonderful Lord. Well, I'm happy. I believe God heard that prayer, don't you? Thank you, Jesus. We're going on here and pray uh, for everyone that the Lord sends us to. Is that what Jeremiah said in chapter 1? Speak everything he commands us. Not be dismayed at one thing. In fact, you're here for that purpose, I know. I can feel it in your bones. Hallelujah. Praise in God. <coughs> Glory to God. Lift your hands to God. We'll pray for you first. Step forward, one step of faith. You could use a healing touch in your body tonight. You want to be healed? Well, we'll start with your healing. Most folks have to be started off with something they understand so they can be taken to something they don't quite comprehend. That's why God always uses a miracle to reach a soul because it's very obvious. The physical and the natural is very obvious. Glory to God. Look upon me. I'm going to pray for you because God has sent me to you. I'm going to tell you what he's commanded me. You don't be dismayed and I won't either. You don't be afraid and I won't either. You've had a, you have had a, a, a physical stress in your spine, in your back. You want that to be gone. Amen. It's gone in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Before I pray for your next item, you may take your hand and press and feel. What do you find in your spine? How long have you suffered with it now? Two years. years. And ordinarily you could feel it if you poked that hard. Yes. Now it's totally gone. Yes. What do you think about this? Is it gone for tonight or is it gone for good, forever? forever. Remember that. For it is. Raise your hands again. Look upon me. The eye is the gate to the soul. Your eye is single. Your body is full of light and her eye is single. So much light in her body it will explode in a moment and heal her totally. The eye is evil, your body is full of darkness. The eye is the gate to the soul. There's been, you've had pressure that has come to your head. In your head, is that right? Yes. It's like migraine. Yes. It's lifted, it's gone. It's departed. Hallelujah. The world's dying for this. And they're talking about it, but I'd like to see them start doing it myself. Very simple thing, no bad God. You just got to get over your fear and your dismay. Hallelujah. Lay your hand on your head and see what you feel now. No pressure at all. Keep your hands up. Now this, to the side of your stomach, I know in your condition that it should be there, but something is strange, strange going on there. It's, it's severe, it's extreme, and it moves like a drawing cramp exceedingly over the right side of your lower stomach, because I'm feeling it now, that's how I know now, some of you, are you feeling it? Yes, uh, Jesus was touched with the feeling of your infirmity. When one suffers in the body, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice, if we're in the same body. <clears throat> I might say, and you know this anyway, that the only way that God can have you contact the world, the natural world, is through your senses. Six senses. And it's the same six senses that work in the other world. You see, you hear, you smell, you, you, you taste, you feel or touch, and you know. They're, they're the six senses. And if they'll work in the flesh, I know they'll work better in the spirit because your flesh is dying every day and now you can't have see and can't have hear. You see, your senses are in your spirit trying to break through your flesh. They're, if they're in your spirit, then they should work better in the spirit than they work in the flesh. Someone says, they're in my flesh. No, they're not. You can drop dead and your flesh will be senseless. Just a lump of senseless clay and you'll be out here in the room as a spirit and as a soul of all your senses perfect. Except they're a whole thousand times keener now. Why? Because the senses are in your spirit. They're not in your carcass. So if they're in your spirit, they ought to work better in the spirit. So hone them, turn them 180 degrees, and work into the supernatural world, which is opposite of the natural world. Okay? You want that gone? I want to tell you what it is now. The babe is going to turn. It's going to turn. In the womb. Okay? And the fear of bleach birth is over. In the name of Jesus, it's done. Thank God. You have no more delivery now. 
You understand that? Does that take you fear away? Yes, it does. God speak to you tonight, did he? Yes, he did. Have a good time speaking to God. Hallelujah. Oh, kasada my hasrael. And everyone says, thank God I'm happy. <coughs> you believe this is the way to have church? Amen to God. Wonderful Jesus. Just to see you raise your hands. Let God heal you tonight. I feel a new unction and a supreme uh, anointing for you for healing. And while I'm standing here, God tells me to pray for your bloodstream, for your bloodstream, that he'll purge it of every sugar imbalance that's in the bloodstream. The boy told me, so I'm not going to doubt it at all. I'm coming against that thing right now, and your life is going to come back to you. You feel like your life is ebbing from you, like you, you may die from time to time. You feel like you're going to die. You're not going to die. You're going to live and not die. Thus saith the Lord. And God is going to cleanse your blood. There are organs that are missing in your body. They're missing. God is going, if he does not recreate them, he will cause them to function as though they were there. And I know you have faith for that. Sometimes your faith is wavered for creative miracles. But it will not waver concerning the organ functioning as though it was there, even though it's not there. See? You'll be a walking miracle that way. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, live. Up, toxic, if angry, thou shalt not die. Take total authority over every sugar imbalance in your bloodstream. Even now, give her blood transfusion tonight. Resurrect organs. Cause them to be where they are not. Hallelujah. Now, have strength and life and live and enjoy thy life. Iki Satabin Rohusai. There's been an off and on spasm that has come through here in your lower stomach. Is that true? Yes. How often have you felt it this past week? Often. Yes. Lay your hand on it so you can feel it now. Is it there now? Yes. You're healed and I haven't prayed for you, but I'm going to pray that it will not return. The prayer is it will not come back. E. <laughs> Glory to God. Everyone thank God for it. <laughs> Little sister, you've had her tenderness off and on. Not so often as this, but l less than this on a rarer occasion in the area of the breast. Is that right? Yes. You're worried about these lumps and you think they're going to be something the doctor will have to look at and remove and examine and test them. Yes. That's a lie. He will not cut them out of your breast. For you see, little sister, for the past seven years in our crusade, every breast condition revealed by the Holy Ghost instantaneously dissolves upon immediate prayer and sometimes before we can even pray. That's the way that sign works. And sorry, but the doctor gets cheated out of that operation. A double shot. Oh, well, he won't lose much. There'll be 10,000 checking over the hospital for tomorrow somewhere. Is all my command thee. In Jesus' name it's done. Glory to God. You feel any power here yet? Yeah. Glory to God. You believe God heard that prayer? Yes, sir. Would you be very honest with me and tell me the truth? Yes. Take your finger now and poke and try and find the lump. Take your time. Search on both sides. Oh, hallelujah to God. What do you think of that? That's great. Oh, come on down. Hallelujah. What did you find? Nothing. What? Nothing. Oh, I told you. Tell me the truth now. <laughs> Is it really gone? Yes, it is. It's really gone. This sister believed it before you even come up with the answer that it was gone. All right? You believed it. She believed it because she knew it had been revealed. God's not the author of confusion. According to an ordained uh, a gift or ministry, uh, God reveals it. He's going to heal it naturally. Raise your hand. Now, God has healed you before, and so you're all practiced up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everyone said, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Of late and recently, it's been like a dryness, dry tickle in your throat here. It goes clear down your bronchial tube. It's coming out. Every mild form of bronchitis leaves you. What feels like a hair in your throat? We got it. Take a deep breath and see how the chest and breathing is. 
Is that better and easier to you? Yes. It's been a little stifling to you. Yes. Keep your hands up. I'm around smoke all the time. Around smoke. Well, don't put up with it. Say something about it. Say something about it now with authority. <laughs> God give her authority to rebuke this smoke. She should not have to smoke other people's tobacco. No more than they should have to chew her chewing gum after she's done chewing it. Hallelujah. Now, you've had some little matter with poor circulation. Is that right? Just like this. Don't tell me a thing. If I need your help, I'll call on you. Glory to God. I was trying to tell you about your left leg, particularly in the ankle and the foot. Is that right? Yes. Now, you didn't tell me about the ankle and the foot. Now, it's healed. God, let the circulation come back to her body. Hush a cup on Glory to God. Thank God it's done. Everyone said it is done. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Well, I guess you've been crippled up long enough, haven't you? Sure. You know I have. Well, give me that thing. Glory to God. There you go. I was a present for you. Freely I receive, freely I give. Lord Jesus, begin to work tonight to loosen the legs of this crippled woman. Lord, we don't care how big the problem is. If they got tumors as big as a tub, we'll tackle anything. Lord, nothing ventured, nothing gained. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step, and she's about to take the step. Lord, I thank you for loosening her tonight from every joint and bone. Take the three-in-one oil can of glory and oil her bone sockets now. Oh, God. There goes the pain from both legs, both hips, and lower spine. There goes stiffness, swelling, and fluid. Oh, copper and rose shine. And everyone said it's happening. It make way we're going to walk around Jerusalem just like John. Oh, my goodness. She's not as limber as you are yet, but she's getting there. One thing I noticed. It don't hurt to do that. No, my leg was hurting real bad. Was it? Yes. Well, let's let the devil see us do it, and a couple of critics do the same. If you happen to be a critic tonight, watch real close, because not only is the suffering left, it's left for good, but joints that haven't worked right in many years are now straightening out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There she goes on her own. She's not hanging on to me no more. Is all that, the pain in the legs, still gone? Yes. Yeah. My right leg was hurting real bad. Your right leg was hurting real bad. You realize that the fact that God took that. Any joint was deteriorating and my ankle bone was deteriorating. The fact that God took that right then means it's gone for good. There's no reason why it should ever come back. No reason whatsoever. Uh, just pick up your right knee there. Oh, you're doing it. She doesn't think she can do it. She already did it. Now, try it again. Take it a little higher this time. Oh. Well, are you quite surprised? Yes. Because I can't pick that leg up by myself. Well, was Sister Hathaway, were you picking her leg up or was she doing it herself? <laughs> Come on out here. I know I know you did it yourself. Come take another step with me now. All right, you stop. Pick it up again. Well I just do it about thinking. That's how Peter walked out of jail. Just <laughs> Peter the angel come into jail and hit Peter on the side and he said he didn't say, Hey, I'm bound to the chain. I, I can't move. What you say, Angel? Rise up quickly. Oh, okay, I'll do it. Jumped up and every chain fell off. It was the easiest thing you ever did. See there? If you don't try to explain it away in your brain, God will make it the easiest thing you ever did. She did it. Well, listen, the pain is still gone. Yeah. It's still gone. And God is perfecting what he's begun as far as you walking like other folk. The first time you prayed for me, I couldn't even lift my left arm. Well, throw it up there now. It's not working. 
Now, someone said, why didn't God work a miracle and do everything all in a moment instantly? Well, he does lots of times. But once in a while, he has to use the gift of healing because that's in there too. There are nine gifts and not eight. And if everybody got uh, their instant uh, work, uh, where would gifts of healing be and where would faith be since it takes time for faith to exercise so it can develop and grow stronger? Miracles are appreciated. Faith, uh, healing builds your faith because you have to take time to be healed. All that time you're using faith, faith is growing. See? Hallelujah. God bless you. Someone said, thank the Lord. <coughs> Glory to God. Well, the great miracle of this is all the sufferings left her. Amen. And you could probably carry that thing on your shoulder now in the Lord's army. I like to put people in the army. Hallelujah. Praising my God. God bless you. This is Sister Owens, right? Very glad to see you again. Come forward. Let's pray for you. Lift your hand. Glory to God. Look upon me. God is strengthening your, your throat and your voice. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. You got it. Because what me he shall remember. remember. Glory to God. You've also had a little tightness through here in your chest on the right side, like a little murmur. It's been in your heart. Heart murmurs coming out. Because you've had very slight sinus in your head and your nose are breathing. Then hang on, close it. Is that open? Really, sure. Really open? Yeah. Take a step of faith. You too are, have a same place in your back, in your lower back. I guess so. Is that where my hand is? Yeah. Well, then don't worry about it. Your back is here. You've had a light burning that gets in your stomach on occasion, comes in your stomach. Comes out of the food that you eat. It's like a heartburn in digestion. You got it all the time. You got it all the time. You got it no more. It's gone. The last thing that bothers you is that sometimes you have in your head a, a little pressure pain, and sometimes your head gets a little dizzy in your head. It takes turns, and this all happened years ago in your life when you got hit in the head. Something stuck you in the forepart. That's when it began. Your head is healed. Your heart burn is left. Your stomach. Because shut up all the outside. Keep your hands up. Ah. Look upon them. You believe God has healed you of these things? How's your back? It's okay. I don't touch your stomach yet because I see in the spirit that you have you have been praying that God would anoint your hands and use your hands. You prayed for that. It's very slight, but it's starting to appear in your fingertips. You see it right there in the tip? They don't just rubbed it off. <laughs> well, there's some more right there, but the next one. He wants that too, okay. This is a, a mild anointing that's starting in your life. You have come from, looks like a far country, from, from a farm. From the West Indies. The day will come when you will return, and you will not return until your hands are totally anointed. And when they are, you will do great works in the West Indies. Thus saith the law. Glory be to God, it's God. Look out here, it's getting real. Woo, my Lord, keep a record of the moments I'm living down here. Glory, raise your hand. You've had a recent affliction that has troubled you in the female organ. You want it healed. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. Again, this you've had, had what feels like a created, like a burning sensation that comes to the female tract, which is a yeast, yeast infection. Yes. You know what it is? Yes. Come with me. God's going to heal it tonight. Oh, it's a God. It's a cup on brain. Now, it's hereditary in your family for the old folks in your family to have kidney trouble. Weak kidneys. Is that so? Yes, it is. Now, how do I know all these things about you and your family? <laughs> Through God. True. And now you're healed. Yes. Of what bothers you? Right in there and in there. Over your kidney. Hmm? Yes. 
Infection is gone forever. Yeast be down, dried up. Down. Yeah, come on, the female organs be repaired and restored. And suffer no more the excruciating attack. It's gone. Everyone said it is. Hallelujah be to God. Glory to God. God has healed you before. You've had a little recent stiffness settling in your joints. Please lift your hands. Just leave in your shoulder blades. Now, bursitis and rheumatism kind of large. It's gone. Now, God has touched you before in your throat. In your throat. You need one more shot of iodine on the thyroid gland. There it is. There's your shot. Hallelujah. Count. Yapapandra. What feels like a band. It's about uh, six to eight inches. All the way around you. It's like a circle. It will now break asunder. Acoli bandrosa. Blessed be my God. Oh, hallelujah to God. Thank God. Lift your hand. Glory to God. You wish God would hear you. You've been very tired in your body, exhausted. You sleep all the time, can't get rested. Yep. Your blood, low. You're anemic. You understand? Uh-huh. You're healed of it. You too have sinus in your head. Okay. That right? Mm-hmm. Gives you sinus headache. Mm-hmm. That's true? Yep. Okay. Check it. What? It's fine. That fast? Uh huh. Where's your headache? It's gone. You mean you had one? A little one. Where's the little one? It's gone. Oh, it's gone. Not me. You've had strange cramps sitting right through there. Uh-huh. There and there. You wondered what it was? Uh-huh. Ovaries. Uh-huh. You had a suspicion that's what it was? I was wondering, yeah. Well, we'll clear up whether or not that's true or not at this time. Now, lay your hands there. What do you find? It doesn't hurt anymore. You mean it been hurting? It was hurting a while ago. Will it ever hurt again? No. Because you have two new ovaries that are healed, that's why. Raise your hands again to God. Oh, everyone said, thank God. Are you happy still? Say, I'm happy still. Glory to God. You have injured your, your, your wrist. Mm-hmm. Your right wrist? Uh-huh. How'd you do it? Um, I had a cyst on it. A like cyst? Uh-huh. All right, grow no more cysts and let the very wrist be repaired and be healed. In Jesus' name. Now, come on, you Pentecostals. <laughs> what else does she need? You may tell me now. What, what does she need? Hmm? Come on, you're supposed to use these gifts too. If you're Pentecost, or change your name, one or the other. You have two choices. You can get the gifts of the Spirit working, or go join the uh, church uptown of a steeple clean up to the sky, which is the closest thing to heaven in the whole church. <laughs> Little girl, you also are somewhat weak in your back. Uh-huh. Is that right? Lord be to God. We Come to me. Your back is healed. Thank my God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lean over and touch your toes. What? I couldn't do that before. Oh, do it again. Let the devil see you do it. Did you really do it? Uh huh. Did it bother you any? No. They've, your family and the people in the church, especially your family, even your little mama, you got a mama? Uh-huh. Has wanted you always to shine and to glow and to excel. And it seems like the more you struggle, the harder it is for you to really become something for God, and you, you hate to disappoint them. <laughs> but I see something glowing now, like glowing like amber, glowing like amber. Does that mean something to you? Uh-huh. What's it mean to you? That's my name. <laughs> What's your name? Amber. Amber? Uh-huh. That's your name? Well, Amber, you're glowing. And you're growing. And everyone said, praise God. Hey, I'm starting to enjoy this. Woo! Shy. Well, you're quite thrilled over what just happened to her. <laughs> mama. <laughs> yeah, well, you took the words out of my mouth. Come, Mama. You two are going to be healed. You have, uh, your blood has been low. The metabolism of your blood has been out of whack. You know that. It is now healed. 
Koshapahatre. You two have had a little trouble with the throat here. There's like a little tiny lump catches in your throat. Yes. It too is your thyroid gland and it's out of whack and balance. Here's your shot of balance. Now you may swallow. What? It's gone. You mean you swallowed the lump? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you now that the sign has happened. I don't usually talk about the signs in this ministry until it happens and then I describe them. I uh, try to explain them. Every lump of the throat for the past five years in our crusades that's revealed by the Holy Ghost instantaneously dissolves upon the swallowing thereof. And don't argue the means and the methods because I didn't ask for it. That's the way God gave it to me. Uh, you can't argue the results. Swallow again. Where is that lump? It's gone. Well, now, if this had been most crusades, they'd made a big deal about that. Hooped and hollered and puffed it up and promoted it and spent the whole meeting talking about that and all these other problems going to waste. You know why I'm not making a big deal about these miracles? There's too much to do around here and it's God's doings and not mine. And I'm not afraid that the next person I prayed for is not going to be healed. That's what they're afraid of. They had a little success and a little bit of good fortune and they don't want to push their luck. I'm talking about a gift of God as opposed to a sovereign move of God. I don't want God breaking through in spite of you. I want you working with God. Then it'll work. Sorry. Your eyes have been weak in your vision. God's going to perk up your vision tonight. You want that? Yeah. They're blurred. It's 2020 return. Hallelujah. You too. This has something that comes right through there. Lower right side. Comes like a diagonal spasm. Gone. Yeah. You're healed. Freed. Everyone said she is. Ooh, glory be to God. Brother Hopper, good to see you. Good to, how did you find out we was over here? We, just, we didn't know ourselves in time to tell you. Praise God. I had a way to call some people in need. <laughs> That's good. Praise God. Brother Harper, I haven't seen you in a long time, but I'm going to pray for you as the Spirit speaks to me. You've been discouraged and you've been tired. You've been very weary and cast down. You, in despair, have about to throw up your hands and say, I can't make nothing gel, nor work, or jive, or fit together. Do not be discouraged about this. For the Lord's time is not thy time. Thou shalt make a move, and thou shalt be under less Drain than thou hast ever been. Thou shalt live life and relax and enjoy it. And now God takes thy weariness, for thou dost work day and night, even when other folks are vacationing and resting and taking it easy. Thou hast had to work, and thou hast aged year after year doing this, but it shall change, saith the Lord, and none shall take advantage of thee again. Hallelujah. Now I speak to the life of your body. Be refreshed and regenerated and revitalized and resurrect and rise up within thee again and with new gumption and ambition attack of the love of life. Because Hassali Mandra, blessed be my God is done. Hallelujah, the God is done. Now when the door opens to make the move, you will not be a bit afraid to do it. Now it's been forewarned. Glory to God. Many times God has healed thee, and many times the oppressor has attacked thee and put back on thee many things that are similar, but not the same. Similar afflictions. I speak to all of you tonight directly. Leave Sister Harper's body. Hush, hush, yeah. Loose this man. Hey, come here, behind. Go out of way. Woo! Yeah. Lift the spine. It's here throughout your spine. One more pouring down the spine. Ah, now thou shalt not panic any more. The spirit of panic shall leave thee. Thou shalt not go fearful and paranoid and run to a doctor every time you feel a symptom or a pain and think that God hath not caused thee to be healed. But thou shalt trust God and stand upon the promise of God and stand on the scripture stand on the word of God thou shalt not be in revival and blessed one night and discouraged in the morning thinking that uh, there is no hope nor help and man has not helped thee but God shall always help thee thou art healed 
Your Kale bin Rose Fire. Hallelujah. Thank my God. It's not for tonight, it's forever. Uh, it's not for just now, for eternity. Glory to God. It's a Kale bin Rose Fire. Glory to God. How the Lord touches thee in new areas of thy body, and not just the old ailments. Here is my Lord's son, and in thy chest and heart thou art restored and renewed. And again, thou shalt tackle life with a new vigor. Hallelujah. Glory oh, to God. Who's the next? It's Lucy. Mm hmm. It's the fire. It's in. Mm-hmm. Don't hurt. Mm-hmm. I pulled three days out two weeks ago while I worked. Run your thumb on all three of them. No. Now, this is done to stay. It's not going to go back out again tomorrow or next week. This time is permanent. Hallelujah. Everyone say, thank God. Are you happy? Say, thank God I'm happy. Oh, we'll be to God. James, is James here tonight? James. 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 Are you James? Raise up your hands, James. Glory to God. Look on me. You do not feel like you're making a lot of progress and that the little tasks that you do for God are overlooked. Man may have overlooked it, but God sees everything you've done for him. And though you have not been a great burning and shining light, you've done your best in these little jobs, in these little tasks. And if thou shalt be faithful, it'll be more important than the great burning star that starred and burned out overnight. Thou shalt endure to the end, James. For God hath thy name in the book of life. She and thou shalt never doubt thy salvation or feel like thou art forgotten. Hallelujah to God. Run Sikapondra. And everyone said, Praise you, Jesus. Oh, glory be to God. Are you happy? Thank God I'm happy. Go ahead and rejoice and be glad. Oh, glory to God. Rishiki Alabahatra. Hallelujah to God. Thank God. Come let God touch you. Look upon me. You want God to hear you. You've been fighting a battle. It's been a mental battle with your mind and your brain. The devil is trying to run you crazy and put you in the nut house. What'd you say? He's not going to. I'm glad to hear that because you and God's a two thirds majority against the devil. <laughs> I enjoy this. I do this all night long, but God won't let me. I can only go to whom he sends me and speak where he commands me, which includes the sermon of the evening. Hallelujah. So I need a word from God. What do you think the preaching was all about tonight? That was a word from God. Hallelujah. God's going to straighten your head out tonight. He's going to screw it on straight. Hallelujah. You will not receive the spirit of fear. You're going to receive the spirit of a sound mind. And here comes that spirit now. There's more you need. You have been bothered in your stomach. In your stomach. God is going to heal your stomach. This has to do with the eating habits and certain things that I will not digest. You understand? Yeah. You also have had weakness of the back. Two things. You stained it working, lifting. You stained it and pulled it out. Mm-hmm. Secondly, you have, at a few years ago in your life, when you were a little younger, began to develop curvature. Curvature of the spine. Is that true? Yeah. Now you're being healed. Bless me, God. Heal this stomach. This spine. Now, God, above all, do the great thing and heal his brain. Oh, let his mind come back to him again and let insanity as a Spirit be chained and cast far away from him. No more shall he be oppressed or attacked by it. Hakai alam dosai. Blessed be God is done. Everyone said, thank God. Rejoice, my brother. Oh, glory to God. You believe it, don't you? He can't help but believe it because it's done. It can't help but be done because he believes it. It's self-feeding. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah be to God. Thank God, thank God. Hallelujah to God. Thank God. My sister, come forward. Raise up your hands to God. Look upon me. Very recently, you've made a, even a, a brand new commitment to God. 
The past is gone. The past is buried. The things that have happened will never be remembered no more. And thou saith the Lord, thou shalt not be harassed and tormented in the future as you have been in the past. Thou hast been weak-willed and a weak need, and uh, thy spine has not stood strong in the past. But thou hast made a new commitment, and now thou art sanctified unto God and purified for God. And now thou shalt not be harassed and bothered and chased and tormented as you have been. For I see this very plainly. And with your new commitment, thou shalt have the desire of your heart, a new unction in the spirit. You shall learn a new fear of God and a new awe and astonishment in his presence. Oh God, I thank you for delivering her from the past and for anointing her for the future. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thou hast the heart of compassion. You have tried so hard to help so many that you have done things on your own and in the natural in the flesh to help them which did not help them at all. From now on you shall only help them in the anointing and in the Spirit of God. For nothing else thou hast learned will matter or accomplish it. Bless be God, it's done. Everybody said it's done. Oh, thank God, thank God, I'm happy. Oh, to God. Amen. God bless Lorena tonight. It's good to see her. Prayed for over the phone. God touched her leg. And uh, Wednesday, the doctor she is going to take this thing off. For the pain and the suffering, left the leg over the phone. And if it would leave over a telephone call, surely it would totally be healed, sealed, and in victory if prayed for by the laying on of hands, which is the more simplistic and more powerful form of the prayer of faith. Lord God, let this very leg now have divine healing flow to it. And though you've healed it where the break was, below the ankle, uh, below the knee, now thou shalt take the pain from the ankle and from the foot. Nothing here have been from carrying the weight of this cast and brace. Glory be to God. Thank God it's done. Hallelujah. Jesus' name is done. Now this leg will not bend good because there's a cast on it. But without the crutches, she walks. Hallelujah. And the pain is still gone. It is. <laughs> I try uh, the ankle and the foot now, which had been troubled because of the weight of the cast, though the leg was healed below the knee where it was broke. That was already healed. Did I even the ankle and the foot? Not tendon the sore. No. Not uh, feeling the weight or the dragging of the cast. No. Well, praise God. Liko Oh, hold on. God's going to touch the other half of you that's not here tonight. Yea, in the body shall he be healed too. And though he may not understand everything about healing, he will understand when all suffering leaves his stomach now. Shakopo Trian Sai. Have him press on it and mash on it and see if it even bothers him. For we rebuke even the ulcer in the stomach. And we rebuke any foreign cell in the stomach in the mighty name of Christ we cause it to depart we curse it and even now let him live and let him live more abundantly with greater strength and do greater things in his latter years than he did in his former years because of a new stomach new cells and a new body have him check upon himself and you check upon him for the change that's been wrought within him just now tonight is done he cost sabahatra all glory to God. It's done. He shall live. He shall live and not die. It's done. Wake him up if you have to and check his stomach. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's done. Shababa cry. Hallelujah to God. All right, come on down. God has finally given you the desire of your heart. And you know it shall be even though it is not yet. But many is the time thou hast tried and made the effort and failed. But you know this time it will not be a failure. Raise your hand. As it shall not be a failure with this child, so shall it not be a failure with you in your life for God anymore. 
your soul shall not fail. And thou shalt not wake up discouraged and despondent and doubting and wondering why and everything that you've done. Saying, where is the word of the Lord? Where is the uh, prophecies of God? Where is, thus saith the Lord, where is the, the message upon which my soul doth feed and, and crave? Mm. Wherein this child shall not fail, neither shall you fail in thy own spirit, in your own life, or with the raising of this child. Oops, I see a double portion. Can you stand a double portion? Ah. A double portion shall come in single waves. Single waves. Ah, but do not give up after this. Hush up our pie. Woo, glory to God. Everyone say, thank God for double portion. Now, I can talk about double portion because I just had one. Of course, they were not girls. I have to confess, they were not girls, but they are identical twin boys. They're both black-headed, and I wonder where they got that from. <laughs> we named them Alex and Abram. Alex, Alexandra, and Abraham on the birth certificate, but their names are Alex and Abram, and we were going to name them something beside A's, but the rest of the A's got mad, pitched the fit, and said, No, we are the A team, and I am, and I am speaking about Alan, Aaron, and Adam. Ashley, Andrew, and Austin. They all took a vote, and they said, it's got to be an A. <laughs> so now I am the proud father of eight sons. Hallelujah. Is that wonderful? Now, I shouldn't say proud. I don't like that word. But I'm real happy. I like that word. Now, this whole society has been brainwashed and thought controlled into thinking that you're not supposed to have children. But children are a heritage of the Lord. Amen. If they're provided for, uh, uh, it's very important to see your seed. It has been true in every generation, except in the last generation, uh, they tried to pervert civilization, which causes Jesus to have to come back in this one, because it cannot go on like this. Say amen. Well, someday we'll adopt a few girls. <laughs> I'm a proven boy maker. I can't make girls. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everyone say praise the Lord. Glory to God. Are you real happy? Are you still in the victory and still in the spirit? Ooh, le kasala mahatre. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I love him because he first loved me. Purchased my salvation on Calvary's tree. Well, let's see. Who wants to be next? Or do you want to go home? What what you want to do? Glory to God. All right, come. We'll pray for you. I felt your spirit reaching out. Raise up your hand. Now, God has given you boldness. And God has given you faith. But you have been struggling and praying for wisdom. The word of wisdom is the gift in which you lack. Amen. We're going to pray for you tonight to receive the word of wisdom so that you do the right thing at the right time. And not stick your foot in it and get yourself in trouble and be out in left field when the ball is in right. Amen. So that word of wisdom is what will be the steering wheel to guide you and the brakes <coughs> to stop you in the nick of time. Hallelujah. Before you hang yourself. Now that's the gift I'm going to pray for. But I'm also going to pray for your healing in your body. Very slightly in your head there is sinus. It's coming out of your head. The drainage that comes into your throat has a tendency towards sore glands or sore throat. Amen. That's your cease. Glory to God. Hasalabandre. In your wisdom, you're going to slow down a little bit and not move quite so fast. You move too fast. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Now, physically, again, I'm back on the physical. God, there has been a, a, a reoccurring symptom that keeps trying to return through the female area of your body and you are not accepting this in your mind you're trying to resist it till it flees from you but every once in a while in a weak moment a voice says you'll probably have to see a doctor about this well you won't need to see a doctor if it don't bother you no more and as of now it will bother you no more it's to be healed again you are weak in the lower spine and the very last bone tailbone is that true? Mm -hmm. you're getting a new tailbone now hallelujah 
Everyone said, praise my God. You have a little crimp that comes through your neck right there on this bone, which is a pinched nerve on the collarbone. Mm -hmm. That's being healed too. Hallelujah to God. There's been a tenderness that also appears in your chest, but it comes in the, bone, the breast bone, center bone. If you touch it, it's tender, very sensitive. Mm -hmm. It's moving out. I call it in rose for it in rose. Recurring female weakness no longer be felt or no longer consider the fact of having to see a doctor. Oh, sure, what he means, right? Hallelujah. Now, Brother Lang on his hands, this CV now, the word of wisdom, not in lower levels, but in greater measures and proportions. For it will cause you to do many things different than you do already. Oh, hush, Receive it now. Brother Lang on his hands. 